booktube. I'm here today with my second video essay on the Brothers Karamazov. Just before we start um, this video essay, uh, note that I am using this edition of um, the Brothers Karamazov, the Bantam Classics. Um, it's translated by Andrew McAndrew, first published in 1970, and this edition is from 1981. And also there will be full spoilers in this video. Today I'll be exploring Freud in relation to the brothers. How does he fit into all this? Uh, so let's jump right into it. Freud loved Brothers Karamazov. He actually called it the most magnificent novel ever written. He even wrote an essay himself on Brothers Karamazov and Parasite where he applied his theory of the Oedipus complex to the book. Since the best person to write that essay already has, uh, I'm not going to replicate that here. Instead, I'm going to look at another Freud's theories, his tripartite psychological model, comprised of the id, ego, and superego. I'm going to further explain those elements as we get into the actual body of the essay. Um, in very general terms, though, the id represents instinct, the ego represents reality, and the superego represents morality. It seems fitting to me that the three brothers and Dostoevsky's novel each embody one of the elements of Freud's theory. In this video, I'll argue that Dmitri represents the id, Ivan represents the superego, and Alicia represents the ego. Of course, Smerdikov seems to throw a wrench into this role, only fitting considering his role in the novel as well. I will address this fourth brother and his role in regards to Freud as well. He is the embodiment of mental illness. Dimitri and the id. So we're going to start at the beginning, both in terms of the firstborn and the first element of Freud's theory that presents itself. Out of the three brothers, Dimitri best embodies the characteristics of the id. To demonstrate that, I'm going to break down the characteristics of the id. So, the id is the only element present right from birth. The only thing an infant knows to do is fulfill its needs. It knows when it's hungry, it knows when it needs its sabers changed, it knows when it needs to be held. So the id is characterized as infantile, and it will remain infantile throughout life. It will not change when confronted with reality and logic. So while Dimitri is the eldest of the brothers, he is also arguably the most childlike. We even have a character, Andre, the man who drives him to Macroy, say this about Dimitri. You're just like a little child. That's what we all think of you. It seems to be a general consensus in their town that Dimitri, despite being an adult, he's approximately 28 in the novel, he is perceived as a child. Perhaps this is because he often acts impulsively, another characteristic of the id. Instinct and impulse are primary features of the id. It is what makes us act impulsively or spontaneously without thought for the consequences. In Brothers Karamazov, Dmitri is often described as spontaneous. For example, he is described as having a direct, spontaneous loathing. During his trial, he is also described as impulsive and unable to control his instincts. They say, it's the act of an animal who is unable to control his animal impulses. He is like an untamed Siberian tiger, only thinking about satisfying those pleasures. These impulses are also tied to the pleasure principle. This is where every wishful impulse needs to be satisfied immediately, again regardless of the consequences. There's no sense of right or wrong for the id. Instead, right and wrong are based on whether something feels good or bad. And we can definitely see that in Dimitri. He pits his pleasure above consequences. We're told right in the beginning when he is introduced that he led a wild gay life that cost a good deal of money. He blows through his inheritance, partying and spending money impulsively for his own pleasure. We have been told directly that he couldn't wait to satisfy all his whims and impulses. He even admits himself that he only looks for the means to satisfy the impulses of the moment. Dimitri's primary motive in life is to seek pleasure, whether through gambling, women, or partying, and at times to his own detriment. <laughs> It is actually this pleasure-seeking impulse that arguably brings about his downfall, as it is believable in his community that he would kill his father and steal money in order to throw a big party. Another problem with impulses is that the id can be aggressive. 
We definitely see that with Dimitri. His aggressiveness is another thing that makes it believable that he was capable of killing his father. We see him being aggressive towards Alusha's father, Sne Snegarev, grabbing him by the beard and beating him. We are told that by the narrator that Dimitri had by nature a temper that he found hard to control. This aggression can also be attributed to the part of the Ed that Freud called the death instinct or the death drive. Freud described the death instinct as an impulse that leads organic life back into the inanimate state and an instinct of destruction directed against the external world. Dimitri displays the death instinct through his multiple threats of suicide. He claims he thought about suicide after his first deal with Katya. He says to Aloysia, there are moments of ecstasy in which we could kill ourselves. He pretty seriously considers suicide after he parties one last time with Grishinka. He even goes so far as to purchase the guns he is going to use. He says, suppose you've decided to fire this bullet into your brain while looking at the guns. And a few pages later, he also says, I will make myself disappear. The death instinct can also be directed at the external world, and we see that in the way that Dimitri is aggressive, as stated above, but also in the way that he almost kills his father. If it weren't for Ivan and Dmitri holding him back, he may have succeeded. Ivan even believes Dmitri killed his father at this point in time, shouting, You're crazy! You killed him! You madman! Dmitri reaches for violence and destruction even as he is seeking pleasure while at a party. He seems to have many disparate impulses within him. But this can also be explained in Freud's description of the id as capable of having contrary impulses exist side by side. This description is very fitting of Dimitri. We are often told of how he is, as Grushinka put it, a wild animal, but a noble and generous animal. Later on, during his trial, the prosecutor very accurately described the character of Dimitri as such. We are in the presence of one of these wide-ranging natures, the Karamazov nature, that can accommodate simultaneously the most contradictory traits and the two infinities, the infinite heights of the most noble ideals and the infinite depths of the lowest festering degradation. They need the two infinities at the very same moment, and without them they are unhappy and frustrated. They feel that their life is not complete. So we can see that the violent, impulsive, childlike man that is Dimitri can embody the id, and actually makes it more believable that he would be capable of killing his father. However, as we know, Dimitri is innocent. And this is due to the influence his brothers, who represent the other aspects of the psychological model, have upon him. So let's take a closer look at his brothers. The next phase of Freud's tripartite to develop is the ego. But we are going to skip over that part because the ego actually works as a go-between uh, for the id and superego. So I believe it's best to establish what the superego is and who represents the superego first. So, which brother best embodies the superego? If you said Aloysia, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. <laughs> um, I can see where you're coming from because actually my first hypothesis was that he too was the best representation of morality. He was thinking of becoming a monk. He spent a lot of time with Zosima. He is set up to be one of the more religious of the brothers. However, looking more critically at his brothers, I came to realize that Ivan is in fact closer to the superego than Alicia. So let me explain this further. According to Freud, the superego is developed between the ages of 3 and 5 and is strictly influenced by parents and parental figures. Freud says a child's superego is in fact constructed on the model not of its parents, but of its parents' superegos. The contents which fill it are the same. We can see the influence Fyodor has on his middle son, Ivan, throughout the text of Brothers Karamazov. Firstly, Ivan is the only one of his sons to actually live in the same house as his father. Both Dmitri and Aloysia are living outside of the family home. He is described as having lived in perfect agreement with his father. We also have Smerdikov observing that of all his sons, you're the one most like the late Mr. Karamazov. Your soul and his 
They're just the same. Smerdikov may not be the most likable character, but he's definitely one of the more observant characters in this novel, and has spent a lot of time with both Ivan and Fyodor, as he lives in the house as well. So I'm inclined to give weight to a statement here. We can see that Fyodor and Ivan even shared some similar beliefs in regards to the westernization of Russia. The main role of the superego is to act as the moral conscious. And this is where I first thought of Ivan being the correct brother for this role. When we are first introduced to adult Ivan, we are told of an article he writes that he seems very passionate about, the role of ecclesiastical courts. He argues that the church should be in charge of punishing criminals because the knowledge that they were rebelling not against men, but against Christ would be a strong incentive not to commit crime. Criminals wouldn't be executed, but excommunicated. I'm not here to argue for or against Ivan. I just wanted to point out that he has an obsession with morality here. We get to see a further explanation of his morals when he says that if there is no God and morality, then everything is permitted. So we can see that he has spent a lot of time thinking about morality and the conscious. We even have Ivan admitting that he himself is the conscious. Conscious? What conscious? I manufacture it myself. Part of being the superego and the concentration on morality is the formation of this idea of the perfect self. The superego strives to be perfect. The superego actually strives to influence the ego away from reality and towards moralistic goals to become the perfect being. And we often see Ivan described as being superior. Another example of this is Ivan's preoccupation with being perfect. We are told that Ivan was absorbed in something within himself, something very important that he was pursuing, some goal, perhaps a very difficult goal. He became preoccupied with being perfect, questioning everything, developing philosophies and moralities. We don't see the other brothers obsessing over the conscience as much as Ivan does. Part of this conscious formation is developed in contradiction to the id. If the id is chaotic, as Freud describes it, and the superego strive for perfect morality, then the superego's role is to work against the will of the id. We see this very directly when Dostoevsky writes, it may be useful at this point to say a few words about Ivan's own feelings for his brother Dmitri. Ivan had never liked him. Even when he felt sorry for him, the feeling of pity was always mixed with a contempt which at times bordered on outright revulsion. Dmitri's whole personality and even his appearance made Ivan cringe. Ivan doesn't support his brother and in fact doesn't even like him much like the opposition of the id and the superego in Freud's theories. Another interesting thing to note is that Freud believed that the superego was formed during the dissolution of the Oedipus complex. The Oedipus complex is the desire of a child for their opposite sex parent and a sense of rivalry with the same sex parents. He based this off the myth of Odysseus who unknowingly kills his father and marries his own mother. Well, the brothers can't marry their mothers because they have died when they were young, but the brothers can certainly kill their father. And in a complicated fashion, Ivan is the most responsible of the three main brothers for his father's death. One could say that the parricide interrupted the internalization of Ivan's superego and resulted in Ivan going insane. This insanity is driven by guilt and anxiety, which is another role the superego fills. In order to control the id, the superego generates guilt, and when those feelings of guilt overwhelm, the balance between the id and the superego can get thrown off, resulting in insanity. And which brother has a mental breakdown? Ivan. Ivan becomes consumed with guilt after finding out that Smirnikov murdered their father under his influence. Oh my God. His guilt brings him to the point that he begins to hallucinate a demon that has come to taunt his beliefs, his conscious. Ivan's anxiety initially developed shortly after his discussion with Smerdikov about Western philosophy and after Aloysia kissed him in response to their discussion on religion and morality. Aloysia's kiss made him begin to question his position because, as I'll discuss later, Aloysia is the ego and represents reality, which challenges Ivan's strive for perfection. And suddenly, he begins to feel bad about his influence on Smerdikov. He knows something is off. The anxiety seemed completely accidental, external, as if it had nothing to do with him. Something was disturbing his conscience. Then, he sees Smerdikov sitting on a bench and 
finally succeeds in identifying the object that has caused him to feel such acute anxiety. He comes face to face with the result of his as yet undeveloped morality. He doesn't actually believe his perfect morality after it's been challenged so many times and he goes to the complete opposite end of the moral spectrum and that truly everything is permitted. It is shortly after this in Smerdikov's confession that Ivan's demon comes to visit, the final embodiment of his insanity. His guilt and anxiety become too strong and he succumbs to what Dostoevsky calls a brain fever. I'll go further into mental illness in the brothers in the last section of this essay, but I just want to establish that a further example of Ivan's representing the superego is the extreme amount of guilt he feels. It is this confrontation with the ultimate conclusion of his previous moral philosophy that actually triggers a change in his morality. He becomes guilt-ridden that he couldn't save his brother and tries to correct his previous morality by admitting the crime himself. And when that fails, he wants to help Dimitri escape. We see that all along Ivan didn't actually believe there was no God and therefore no morality as he even admits that he has believed in God all along and was just experimenting with different moral philosophies. He says to Aloysia, and so I will just state here plainly and briefly that I accept God. What we see in Ivan is a continued development of the superego after the death of his father, just as Freud explains. So if Aloysia isn't the superego, then he must be the ego. Let's note that I didn't just come to this conclusion solely through the process of elimination. Dimitri is clearly the id, Ivan after careful consideration is the superego, so that must mean Alicia is the ego. But he actually fits this role more so than any of his other brothers. So let's delve into this Karamazov. An interesting thing to note that helped me decide to place Aloysia as the ego instead of the superego is that Aloysia is often described as non-judgmental. We are told in his introduction that he refused to sit in judgment of others. And even his father is relieved to be in his presence because Aloysia saw everything and condemned nothing. He offered his father something that he had never had before, a complete absence of contempt for him. Freud said that the ego is not moral. It merely works with reality to balance the id and superego. It is the superego that is highly moral, as we saw previously. So despite Aloysia's seeming preoccupation with religion, he is not the judging and moral superego. The ego is what is supposed to keep the id and superego balanced. It is the part of the inner being that is modified by the external world. It uses experience to mitigate the impulses of the id with the strive for perfection from the superego. Early on in the text, Zosima informs Aloysia that he should leave the monastery. He says, the monastery is really no place for you. You must leave the monastery, leave it for good. Zosima, who is described as having great mystical insight into people, knows that Aloysia needs to go out into the world and let him develop and experience reality outside of the church. Note that Dostoevsky stresses that this doesn't mean that Aloysia is no longer religious. This is important in Dostoevsky's personal belief in the importance and reality of faith, especially in Russia. Reality is also important to the ego. It actually runs off what Freud called the reality principle. It does this by working out realistic ways of satisfying the id's demands, run on the pleasure principle, which we talked about earlier, and avoiding the negative consequences of giving into it. And Aloysia is actually established as a realist from very early on in the text. Dostoevsky even comes in directly to say that Aloysia was more of a realist than anyone I know. Despite being the youngest brother, Aloysia is pushed out into the world by his father figure, Zosima. Instead of being allowed to hyper-focus on religion and moral philosophy like Ivan, Alicia may come off as an innocent child, but he is arguably the most mature of either of his brothers. We see Alicia stepping in to fix some of the problems caused by his brother Dimitri, or the id. He needs to use his experience as a realist with the reality principle to balance out the id's pleasure principle. We see Alicia give direct commands to his brother to save him from murdering his father. After having lunged at his father, Ivan and Aloysia had to force Dmitri off of him, and Aloysia says in a commanding voice, Get out of here, Dmitri, at once. Go. It is Dmitri's violent instinct to fulfill his desires that makes him want to hurt his father. Ivan's morality that is literally holding him back, and Aloysia's final command that makes Dmitri stop. It is also Aloysia that Katya asks to help Dmitri's actions towards Snedegrief. Dimitri, in a fit of uncontrolled anger, had dragged Senegrieve out of a pub by his beard and beat the man. 
Katya believes that Aloysia is the only one capable of rectifying Dimitri's actions. She says to him, as you and only you can do. Freud argued that the id is stronger than the ego, but the ego is like a person riding a horse, where the horse is the id. Obviously a horse is stronger than a human, but with the right influence, the rider controls where the id goes, how fast it goes, when it stops. So we see Aloysia directing the behavior of his brother when he tells Sinegrieve that Dimitri will apologize. He says, my brother will apologize to you completely sincerely, and if he must, he will kneel on the same square. I will make him kneel, for if he refuses, he will no longer be a brother to me. Aliosho? Teď ti řeknu něco, co jsem ještě nikdy nikomu neřekl. Víťo, musíš se omluvit kapitánovi Sněgirovou. Čertvem kapitána Sněgirova, Aliosh. In these early passages, we can see that Aloysia has some control over the id. But what happens when Aloysia does not exert that control? After the death of Zosima, Aloysia gets distracted and forgets to go to his brother. Dostoevsky writes, Suddenly, the picture of his other brother, Dmitri, flashed through his head. It just came and vanished in a flash, vaguely reminding him that he had something terribly urgent to do. Something that could not be delayed another minute. Some duty to perform. Some obligation. But even that awareness left him indifferent. Did not go to his heart. And within a minute, he had forgotten it altogether. It is this neglect that leads to all the trouble that Dimitri gets in. Arguably, if Aloysia had gone to Dimitri at that moment, if the ego had the strength to exert its influence over the id, Dimitri would not have gone to his father's house and have placed himself in the position to believably be accused of his father's murder. We see that Aloysia has to consistently balance out both of his brothers. Freud said that the ego, driven by the id, confined by the superego, repulsed by reality, struggles, works to bring about harmony among the forces and influences working in and upon it. We see throughout the text how Aloysia works in this fashion. Dostoevsky directly supports this in the text when he describes Aloysia thusly. Aloysia loved both Dmitri and I, but what could he hope for each in the face of all these violent and conflicting passions? A man could get completely lost in all these complications, and Aloysia could not bear the unknown because his love was an active one. He was unable to love passively. As soon as he came to love someone, he had to help that person. And in order to help, he had to set himself a goal. He had to be sure what was good for each person, what it was he needed, and then when he was sure of what was best for everyone, he got to work. His role as the ego dictates that he needs to do what is right for both the id and the superego. We even have Zosima stressing to Aloysia that he needs to stay close to his brothers. Not just one of them, but both of them. We can see Aloysia's influence on Ivan as well as Dimitri. It is not just the id that needs to be controlled by the ego, but also the superego. Freud says that the ego serves three masters. The external world, the superego, and the id. Aloysia's influence on Ivan, the ego's influence over the superego, is not strong enough when the brothers are first introduced. We are told that Aloysia was very eager to get to know Ivan, but although his brother had been in town for two whole months and they saw each other quite often, they still seemed unable to really make friends. He even admits to losing control of Ivan later as they are visiting the Koklikovs. As Ivan storms out of the room, Aloysia laments, Ivan, he called after his brother like a lost child. Come back, Ivan. No, no, I know he'll never come back now. Nothing, nothing will bring him back now. I know it. It's all my fault. He needs to develop his relationship with his brothers in order to better control them. They actually do become closer after Ivan seeks out Aloysia and they discuss the role of religion and freedom in the Grand Inquisitor and the subsequent chapters. They develop more of a relationship and later we see that Aloysia can control Ivan's feelings of guilt and meter out his morality. In conversation with Aloysia, Ivan is described twice as recovering his self-control and regaining complete control of his emotions. However, he ultimately decides that he doesn't need his brother's influence. Ivan is, after all, the superego, the superior perfect self, and he doesn't need reality to control him. He dismisses Aloysia, saying, So, from now on, consider we don't know each other, and this is for good. It is Aloysia's lack of control over Ivan that drives him to insanity. Ivan's superior morality remains unchecked by Aloysia's reality, and his moral degradation leads to his father's murder and his subsequent hallucinations. 
Aloysia's preoccupation with Zosimo and his death not only fails to keep Dimitri in check, but also Ivan. When Aloysia finally comes back to reality, he remembers to check in on his brothers and notice that it is Aloysia's reappearance in Ivan's life that causes his hallucination to disappear. He knocks at the door and Ivan's demon vanishes. It is at the end, when all three brothers are finally working together, that there is finally resolution to the story. Dimitri has made his decision, Ivan is on his way to recovery, and Aloysia has finally rationalize the challenge to his beliefs. It may not be a happy ending, but after all, this is Russian literature. What did you expect? Them all to run away and live happily ever after as one big happy family? Now, Freud's three-part theory of the personality would fit perfectly with the brothers Karamazov if only there wasn't a fourth brother. If Dmitri, Ivan, and Aloysia represent the id, superego, and the ego, that seemingly leaves no room for Fyodor's illegitimate son, Smirnikov. However, I think that much like his role in the novel, Smirnikov is there to challenge the brothers and represents what happens when there is an imbalance between the three aspects. There are three ways in which Smirnikov represents mental illness in the brothers, each one being when an aspect of the tripartite personality gets out of control. When we are introduced to Smirnikov, we are informed right away that there's something not quite right with him. He's not only described as an utterly taciturn and unsociable young man, and a rather arrogant fellow who seemed to despise everybody, but also as loving to hang cats and then bury them with great ceremony. Modern studies have shown that 70% of violent offenders have a history of abusing animals in their childhood. We know that Smirnikov eventually moves on to murder a human, his father. ends up hanging himself. This is representative of when the death drive of the id is allowed to fulfill its instinct instead of being reined in by the superego and the ego. Freud described the death drive as the inherent tendency in all organic things to return to an inorganic state. We see many times how Dimitri claims he is either going to kill his father or commit suicide. He doesn't actually kill himself or his father because he has his brothers literally hold him back at points. However, the brothers are not there for Smirnikov in the same fashion, and he is allowed to do these things. Thus, he is the id out of control. Next, we can examine ways in which the superego gets out of control in relation to Smirnikov. As established previously, the superego is the internalization of the father figure. Freud argues that the installation of the superego can be described as a successful instance of identification with the parental agency. This is interesting in Smirnikov's case. Firstly, he was rejected by Fyodor, his birth father. Yes, he was given the patronym Fyodorovich, which established that he was in fact his father, but he didn't raise him. He left that to Grigory. And we see that while Grigory at least made sure Smirnikov was fed and clothed, he also rejected him, saying, you aren't a human being. You are made of the slime in the bathhouse. That's what you are. A thing that Smirnikov is said never to forget or forgive. So right from the beginning, his role model for his superego is never established, as he has no father figure to internalize. His only role model for morality comes later in life in the form of Ivan. And the conversations between them are interesting, as Smirnikov does not witness the full scope of Ivan's moral philosophies. He does not see the growth of Ivan's character. He's only able to grasp the early form of Ivan's morality. The morality that if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. Já si vážím vašeho vzdělání, protože jsem taky vzdělaný. <laughs> Tenkrát jsem vás bedlivě poslouchal, jak jste vyprávil, že je všechno dovoleno. Mohl bych se vás tedy jako vzdělaného člověka znovu zeptat. Je Bůh? Už si to jednou slyšel, že není neotravuj. And this skews Smirnikov's super-ego morality. His idea of the perfect being is someone who is so incredibly individualistic and selfish that they do not care about other humans. It is also interesting to note that the superego develops during the dissolution of the Oedipus complex, and well, Smirnikov actually murders his father, 
maybe not to marry his mother as his mother is dead, but he fulfills at least half of the complex. By murdering his father, his superego is not allowed to fully develop and remains skewed by Ivan's incomplete philosophy. Lastly, we see how Smirnikov's ego is also not able to fully develop and gain control over the violent impulses of the id and the perfect morality of the superego. One of the ways in which the ego is developed is by being exposed to the real world. In Brothers Karamazov, we are told of Smirnikov's desire to visit those happy places in Europe. However, his status as a servant, his lack of money, is holding him back. He is not able to go out and be changed by the world. He is stuck in Skotopregnovsk. In the Karamazov household as a servant, despite displaying as much intelligent and right to live as the other brothers. Another way in which Smirnikov's ego is broken is seen in his relationships, or lack thereof, with his brothers. It is important for the ego to be in relations with the superego and the id. And I've established that earlier when describing how Aloysia embodied the ego by having a relationship with both of his brothers. But Smirnikov's role as both illegitimate and therefore unable to inherit anything from his father, to be labeled as a Karamazov and to be as part of the family unit, and also as a servant, prevent a brotherly relationship from developing. As Zosima states, let there be brothers first, then there will be brotherhood. Without even being acknowledged as a brother, Smirnikov is unable to form these relationships. He will never be an equal with Dmitri, Ivan, and Aloysia, and he will never be able to control the superego and id, thus resulting in mental illness. As Freud said, mental illness arises when the ego is incapable of maintaining control of the id and superego when their impulses are too strong. We can see that Smirnikov is the result of being outside of the brotherhood, outside of the tripartite personality. He wasn't able to fully develop these aspects, and as a result, he was mentally ill and affected those around him as well. He murdered his own father, drove Ivan to madness, he blamed it all on Dmitri, and even influenced Aloysia. Remember, it was Smirnikov who convinced Alusha to put a pin in some food and feed it to dogs. But it was by working together, finally, that the legitimate brothers were able to overcome these things, unfortunately leaving Smirnikov with no choice but to give in to his death drive and commit suicide. So while I may or may not agree with Freud's theory in regards to real life, it was an interesting exercise to apply it to the brothers Karamazov. The three brothers almost fit perfectly into each of these aspects of the id, ego, and superego. It was a bit more challenging when I realized that I had to include Smirnikov, but I think his role shows what happens when each aspect gets out of balance. Dostoevsky had such great psychological insight into characters and the human psyche. Even Freud acknowledged that. As Rakuten described the Karamazov, here these three sensualists are stalking one another now, each one of them with a knife hidden in the leg of his boot. The three of them have met head on, and you may be the fourth. We have to keep an eye on all four to see who has the knife and who will actually use it. Thank you so much for um, exploring this topic with me and let's continue the discussion in the comments down below. Das Vidanya! Mm -hmm.